<laughs> Welcome to the CDSC Spring Symposium. Uh, this year's symposium, I'm sure you all know, <laughs> but I'll say it again for the recording, is multiplayer, uh, critical perspectives on video games and online environments. Uh, I <laughs> wanted to thank the sponsors of this event uh, for their contributions. Uh, they are long and, uh, well, uh, very important um, in their contributions. So I'd like to thank the Center for Digital <laughs> Scholarships and Curation, uh, WSU Library, uh, Libraries, Native American Programs, the English Department, the History Department, the Asia Program, the Sociology Department, and the Department of Critical Culture, Gender, and Race Studies. So I met Dr. Gray uh, first time uh, several years back when she wrote me uh, to ask me to write a preface uh, to her very important uh, book on X Li Xbox Live uh, communities. Um, and when she asked me, I was really humbled uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, first, because I had stopped writing on video games. Um, for For a variety of reasons. Um, and I'll just briefly say three of them. One, um, Video games take a long time to do research on, especially mm -hmm. when you get stuck on a level. Um, <laughs> and I got stuck on a level on Grand Theft Auto, and I was stuck. <laughs> and then my student moved away, who, said, who had told me he was going to get me past the level. And then he moved away. And I was like, I am not going to send you uh, my memory stick, which at the time we were you know, saving everything on. And he was like, just send it to me, Hawaii. I'll get you past I was like, this is ridiculous. Uh, and then I had uh, two young kids, um, and they were getting to an age where I was like, I, you know, I don't know if I want to play Grand Theft Auto with you sitting right next to me. Um, the, the, and I don't have 10 hours. Um, and then I had, on top of that, well, I could justify to myself um, and maybe a few uh, people about playing video games. Um, I had many inside this academic space uh, those with more power than me saying, stop, stop messing around with the kid stuff. Uh, you just want to do research because it's fun. Uh, grow up. Um, one, you know, that it's an addiction, uh, referencing various kinds of research. And so I had stopped really writing on video games. And so when I was asked, it was very humbling because I was like, why do you want me to write it? What do I, I don't even do this. Uh, and then I read her book and I was like, whoa, look at this. Um, this work is amazing, looking at uh, not only games in terms of representation and production, uh, but online communities and uh, racial profiling and racism and sexism directed to gaming communities and resistance. And so I was really um, amazed by the work and humbled that I was being asked to write uh, the <laughs> preface and then um, inspired to return to the work, um, not only through the work that that Dr. Gray was doing, um, but our collaborations that developed and our friendship. And so I'm really excited um, that she's here. Um, and I know as someone who uh, continues to learn a lot from her work, um, that, that this is a treat for everyone here. Uh, so just as a formal introduction, uh, Dr. Gray is an assistant professor in the School of Social and Behavioral Sciences in the New College at Arizona State University, and also as a faculty associate at the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society at Harvard University. She previously served as MLK Scholar and Visiting Professor in Women and Gender Studies and Comparative Media Studies at MIT. Her work broadly intersects identity and new media, although she has a particular focus on gaming. Um, her book that I mentioned, Race, Gender, and Deviance in Xbox Live, Rutledge 2014, which, uh, which has been described by T.L. Taylor as, quote, an insightful, original, and compelling piece of research um, is a must read. Her current monograph is tentatively titled On Being Black and the Journey to Intersex Intersectionality in Digital Gaming um, <coughs> is currently under contract with LSU Press. She also has a collection coming out with the University of Washington Press called Woke Games. With Co David Leonard. Co-edited by somebody. <laughs> Co-edited with somebody. Um, 
Her work additionally has been featured in both academic and public outlets, a, n a number of anthologies. Uh, she is also a featured blogger and podcaster with uh, Not Your Mama's Gamer. Uh, and you should follow her on Twitter, at Kishana Gray. Um, if you enjoy, and you will, please, uh, join us uh, after, uh, as Dr. Gray uh, will be uh, participating in a workshop this afternoon from 3.30 to 5.30 around designing narratives of empathy. Um, after her talk, there will be time uh, for questions and answers. Um, we have viewers online, so please use the microphone provided to ask questions. Without Thanks. further ado, Shana Thank Gray. you. Like, David, I feel like we need to do like the whole like Wakanda kind of thing. Like, we, we, okay. we got to do that. <laughs> I appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you. Y'all, I'm a huge fan of David Leonard. I'm jealous of y'all because y'all get to interact and hang out with him on a daily basis. Don't take him for granted because he's really dope out here in these academic streets, okay? Um, I really, I got into gaming because of, I read the, um, I think it was the Don't Be a, Don't Be a Player, something. I can't remember the title of it. What is it? Don't Be a Hater. Don't Be a Hater. I read that um, in grad school and also I read the piece um, that Andre Brock did highlighting um, Shiva Alomar and Resident Evil and I didn't realize that that was even like a possibility to do right so like I thought it was um, like gaming scholarship I didn't really know much about it you know the program that I was in focused a lot like on you know like social movements you know different kinds of things like that so when I read their work I'm like oh so this is possible now I didn't know the whole narrative around gaming and how it's not really like accepted in academia you know all the things that he outlined um, I didn't realize that, so I, I received a lot of it, and I was actually gonna gonna switch gears away from gaming. But I was like, nah, fuck that, I'm gonna do it anyway. Um, so I'm here, here I am. It's resonated with folks, and I'm glad. Um, when I walked into the space, I read, you know, I've, I'm, I'm interesting. I'm interested in like what what what's put up, right? I read the the curate definition, and um, number two really stuck out to me. To act as curator of a museum, exhibits, etc to look after and preserve. And I really think that that captures like the essence of my work and what I do, right? So I don't, I've been told that I'm not a gaming scholar, right? You know, cause I don't study like representations and depictions and things like that, like the actual video games. So I'm like, okay, that's fine. Um, but what I do do is study the people who play them. I have been fortunate enough to have spent like, I think I'm going, it's like a 10 year ethnography right now. I've been doing this work like for like a decade where I've been in this really dope community and Xbox Live where these women, these people of color, these lesbian women, these folks have embraced me into their communities and I'm, I'm hoping to be able to curate and archive and document their stories um, in an amazing way. I hope, I hope I'm doing that. Um, but the reason that I got into this work is because of my own personal experiences as a woman of color in gaming communities. Now, I'm a lifelong gamer. So, like, I grew up, you know, older brothers played Nintendo, Atari. You know, my mama bought me. So, it was my, it was to me, it, was, it wasn't to a brother. My mother brought me a Sega PlayStation. And then I always got, like, this narrative of, like, no, you can't play. Um, no, you're not really, like, a gamer, you know. So, that, that bothered me to the point where I, I remember just like yesterday when we were in the space gaming, um, I was talking to some of your students and they were telling me about the games that they were playing and I was like, I can beat you in it, I can beat you in all that. So right now, I'm gonna just put it out there. Yo, my track record is great right now. Um, I don't lose that much in a lot of games, so if anybody wants to play some games, 2K, Matt, catch me outside, that's right. We can, we can play all of that. <laughs> um, but I, I have found myself really pushing against and pushing back and resisting, you know, the narrative that's often associated and attached to um, my body as in this intersectional body, as a woman, as a person of color, right? Um, but I realized, I was like, I don't want to do that anymore because I realized I started to centralize particular narratives of privileged bodies and I was like, you know, I'm not going to do that anymore. You know, so I'm going to focus on these stories that, that don't get told, um, that, um, that we don't know much about, right? So again, the dissertation, you know, kind of started out like um, it was just a class project where I wanted to see what the literature said about um, what the experiences in online spaces was. And so I just thought it was going to be tons of stuff. You know, I could, it was like a few days before it was due. I procrastinated. And so I was like, yeah, I'll find some literature real quick. Let me, no, it, it wasn't any. So thank, I'm really thankful, you know, for the work that, you know, like David Leonard and Andre Brock, Lisa Nakamura, I'm really thankful for the work that we had like on digital race and stuff. 
But I really wanted to see, you know, the ethnographically, what are those stories? And the, my professor at the time, um, he basically just said, okay, Kishana, I know you procrastinated, but how about you just kind of write up, you know, your own personal experiences, like in an auto-ethnographic kind of way. And so I did that, and that's kind of turned into like this whole body of literature that I'm going to, I'll walk you through. Um, um, so the, the crux of my work um, is black cyber feminism. Um, uh, Professor Chang, he had just talked um, a bit about, you know, Sadie Plant and some other scholars, uh, techno feminism, cyber feminism that was really significant to this body of work, right? So a long time ago, you all probably you weren't even thought about. Um, there was a time the internet media studies they thought that you know the internet was going to save us. You know, there's very like these utopic ideals. You know that that both you know Professor Condis and Professor Chang have have talked about. Um, and you know there was like I remember like that quote from like the New Yorker that you know on the internet nobody knows your dog, right? So that kind of permeated a lot of the scholarship as well, um, in dangerous ways, um, because as as Professor Condis you know highlighted, um, the assumption was that we're all a part of this singular narrative, the singular story, and that narrative becomes whiteness, it becomes masculinity, it becomes heteronormativity. Um, and that's dangerous for people who don't uphold that. So in thinking about like the, the story and the narrative of age, about how um, you know, she had to forego her body because it's not read legibly in the space, that is the crux of a, what a lot of folks inter engage with, that's their reality when they're online, right? So whenever I started this project, I realized that a lot of those resistance practices, a lot of those um, uh, tactics of survival, strategies for coping, were really rooted in this premise of black cyber feminism, with it, which is intersectional at its practice. Now, I won't read this, we'll, we'll come back to this and I'll explain how I got to the point of these three tenets. Actually, I'll go ahead and read them. Um, so the first tenet of black cyber feminism is the social structural oppression of technology and digital spaces. Two, the intersecting oppressions experienced in both physical and digital spaces. And three, the distinctness of digital media practices of women. So I'll kind of, I'll unpack some of that so that can make sense to you. And so you can cite my work, cite her work, hashtag cite her work, don't forget to cite me. Um, I'm very, I'm intentional too, I'll, as an aside, um, I'm intentional um, to make sure that I put my references up here. Because um, I used to you know, put like a lot of pictures and make it fun and lively. But I had a conversation with, one, with some students that said, you know, they, always, they couldn't remember what my research was. They couldn't remember what my work was. So they didn't, they didn't cite me. They would narrate something that I said, but then end, end up citing somebody else. So we won't have that problem. Go right ahead. Yeah, what's up? <laughs> Absolutely, I'll make sure they're up. Absolutely, sure will. Um, so I had to have a conversation between um, black feminist thought and cyber feminism because cyber feminism early on was really adopting this utopic, um, this cybertopian kind of ideal that you know we can finally forego our physical bodies, we can go online and be anything that we want to be, right? Um, because that just wasn't panning out for um, folks who didn't uphold this ideal, the default norm, the white cis heterosexual masculine norm, right? Um, so, and there was a lot of, you know, rightfully so, a lot of um, feminists came out and they, they criticized and critiqued this perspective. So Flanagan and Louie, they were, um, this is a really um, important quote that kind of critiques cyber feminism. So if a fundamental aim of cyber feminism is to change and reorganize social and political realities by engaging technology to address gender issues, then little progress has been achieved for women. Cybertopian feminists praise the internet's anonymity in enhancing female agency, arguing that women are able to transcend their sexual and gender particularities without fear of retaliation. Um, and you all kind of exist in this post-Gamergate you know, reality where you know that's not the case at all. And also with the, with the expansive nature of like technologies that they aren't just textual anymore. You know, they're, they're audio, they're visual. Um, so if you think about, you know, your experience in your, these social communities that you're in, like on Twitter, you can do, you can put text there, you can upload a picture, you can upload a video, same as Facebook, and the same is happening in gaming communities. So right now, how many, uh, well, let's kind of survey the room, um, PC gamers, show of hands. PS4 gamers, show of hands. Okay, maybe? I think it's at home. Oh, okay. <laughs> Xbox. You know, okay. Switch, Nintendo Switch, folks. All right, that's what's up. We out here, okay. We. Yeah, okay. All right, that's what's up. Um, so the spaces that I'm looking at are mostly, you know, um, PS4, 
Xbox 360, Xbox One, um, where most folks interact and engage using their voice, right? So you're, you're in the game, you're talking to people. So I want to make sure that people are aware of what kinds of spaces these are. Um, and so what I found in some of my earlier research, let me go ahead and skip through, through these parts because we've been introduced to Lisa, Lisa Nakamura's work. Um, so awesome. Anna Everett, want to make sure to shout out Anna Everett here. Um, she was also during this time where, you know, we were kind of talking about, talking about like the utopic kind of ideals of, of the Internet. Um, and people, you know, were using uh, women and people of color as like the poster children for like the digital divide, you know, uh, conversations around access. And it was a very limited definition of what it meant to be engaged with technology. So um, Anna Everett's work rightfully said, hey, forget that limited definition, that skewed um, narrative that you have. Let's go and see what the innovative things that these folks are doing, particularly black women, um, what they were doing around organizing different social movements around the Million Women's March, which you all have no idea what that is. So when you have some time, go Google Million Women's March. It's not the march that just happened just the other day. Um, so make sure that you know what that is. Um, but she was, um, here's a really awesome quote. Rather than decry the disproportionate rate of computer technology, diffusion within the black diaspora community, everyday African American women found an ingenious remedy or tactic of cultural intervention via the internet. So not only did they utilize, you know, high tech kind of culture, they also utilized low tech um, culture, you know, that relied on just everyday kind of media from making flyers, you know, plastering things out, um, talking on street corners, mobilizing churches and different religious organizations. Um, so they created like these networks of organizing that really led to the, the success of the Million, Million Women's March. I wanted to get um, back to this concept of, um, of linguistic profiling. Um, the experiences of people like me and Xbox Live really disrupted this notion that you can go online and be anything you want to be because we hear how you sound. So whenever you know, you're talking in these communities, you know, people hear that you speak with an accent. They hear that you speak with black vernacular. They hear that you may speak within, with an accent, Spanglish, any whole host of, of things within these spaces, and they will lash out because as has, as has been already talked about, the default user within these spaces is assumed to be one that speaks with standard American English and is in a body that is similar to a white male's body, right? Within this book, who all read this book? Who got my book? All right, good deal. Make sure y'all go get it. Um, this kind of highlighted, um, it centered um, more of um, um, discussions around masculinity and marginalized masculinity. Um, and it started um, the path of this, um, I've been with a community of black and brown men and their experiences in gaming communities. Um, and so they really highlighted um, how they aren't able to uphold like this ideal of masculinity. I know a lot of times, you know, when we talk about masculinity, we don't delineate, you know, between those, those bodies that, that aren't the white, heterosexual, Christian, you know, body. Um, and I think we ignore those, those perspectives. And I think during Gamergate, um, a lot of people didn't talk about what men who deviated from the norm of masculinity, we didn't talk about what their experiences were. Queer men, men of color, because um, their experiences were just as awful. Um, because we now know that Gamergate was, was more than just like attacks on women. You know, um, it kind of led, as, as we argue in our book, in the Woke Gaming book, and um, as other people have highlighted, you know, it kind of served as this precursor um, um, to the, the rise of Donald Trump and how a lot of marginalized white men, you know, feel disempowered and have done some really interesting things to take their power back, right? Um, I, I noticed it was this piece that I realized that I was going to have to go outside of gaming spaces because the people who I um, uh, studied um, weren't just in gaming. Because women um, and people of color weren't able to fully participate in Xbox Live because their bodies deviated from this norm, they utilized Twitter a whole lot. You know, so they developed, you know, hashtags, so they would have conversations, they would um, live tweet different... Um, uh, some of their favorite streamers that were on YouTube or, you know, somebody would be twitching and they would have a conversation in Twitter or in Tumblr. Um, and I thought that was like really powerful and really amazing. Something else that this article also did was highlight the fan fiction that's around gaming. Um, so there was a lot of, you know, just as Professor Chang was talking about, like um, the lack of real rich queer narratives. 
gamers are already doing that. They're creating so, you know, Super Mario Brothers aren't brothers at all. You know, they're gay lovers and they've just had to live, you know, in hiding, you know. So there's some really amazing um, kind of fan fiction that people are like, okay, you're not going to create these stories for me. Fuck it, I'll do it. We'll do it ourselves. And I think that was the, the real power that, that, um, that highlighted that if you're not accepted into a space, there are other places where you can still participate. Because we often get asked this question, like if these spaces are so toxic, then why are you there? Why do you still participate? And I'm like, no, we're gonna, we like doing this. How about you fix the toxicity in these spaces as opposed to asking us to leave, right? Um, a really uh, useful quote from this, thus many women of color employ social media to document and bring attention to their experiences in the gaming world. And I think this has like, led to my path of, of incorporating uh, transmediated gaming, which is a problematic kind of framework, but it's what I've got right now and it's useful and I'm going to be talking about that um, next week um, somewhere else um, that kind of um, shows how you know the failure of a lot of these communities to protect all of their gamers and what what a lot of folks marginalized folks still have to do to to participate one of those we got some cross-pollination here megan so I'm, but um one of those really dope spaces that that's outside of game the gaming communities is um black girl gamers so this was a really innovative powerful um group um that started off in facebook that's now has a, a heavy presence in twitter um, they do some really amazing, cool things in Tumblr. Um, but basically, they said, hey, we're we out here. Um, um, there are thousands of women that are a part of this community. Um, and I think they wanted to first dismiss and dispel the myth that black women weren't gamers and, and that women weren't gamers. Um, and to also show that, hey, um, we're good. You know, we're not just playing, you know, our boyfriend's consoles. You know, this is these are ours. Um, and they also do different kinds of things with like organizing different kinds of tournaments um, where they, they play, they have like, you know, kind of clan play, guild play, um, and they use these different social, social mediated spaces to kind of organize and plan those things. Um, so it's been a really beautiful space for a lot of folks who have been excluded from traditional gaming spaces like to go. And there are, there are several out there, um, not just for, for black women, but also for black and brown men, um, for queer gamers, um, for trans gamers. Um, and these spaces, they're really, really powerful. Um, one, of the, one of the main things that I, I focus on is the, the lack of response by these corporate entities that control these spaces, right? So for instance, you know, I've been, I wrote Xbox Live a whole lot. Um, while I was dissertating. Um, they didn't respond. Um, that's okay. Um, um, yeah. Twitter, um, I've reached out to Twitter about the, um, about the, um, the practices of like Gamergate. Of course, we know how that all went down. Oh, that's another, that's another conversation. Even Twitch. Right now, I'm looking at um, what black gamers are experiencing within um, Twitch. Does everybody know what Twitch is? Who doesn't know what Twitch is? Okay. Um, so in this piece, um, they're just too urban, black gamers streaming on Twitch. Um, I focus a lot on the comments section. I know I shouldn't be in the comments, but I like going to the comments section because they're very telling. Um, when black gamers stream, regardless of their content, um, they are treated as an other. Um, they're not engaged fully as like their full participants as they have um, actual contributions to give to gaming. Um, and what has happened, you know, I'm following um, a few gamers, there's one gamer in particular, he has masked his actual voice. He uses a, um, an avatar that's not a black man. Um, and he has made the statement that people engage with him more when he's not perceived to be black, right? And whenever he does stream as a black man, um, you know, the commentary comes in, the negative racialized commentary comes in. Um, the donations go way down. Um, and he did like, a, like an experiment which was really innovative. You know, he kind of created a script um, for a game that he was playing and he said the exact same thing, um, but it was read differently when he was reading or engaging in the, this script. Um, it was read differently as, as a black man. Um, and I think that, that quote, they're just too urban, you know, that's racially coded language um, that a lot of people, you know, they may not engage in this overt kind of racism and they may not be called like the N-word, um, but people will identify these different racially insensitive ways to, um, to talk about um, these, these black streamers. Um, 
As has been explained, social interactions in Xbox Live are extremely racialized due to linguistic profiling based on how non-white and or non-male users of the space sound privileging the white male as the default gamer. Video game culture has privileged the default gamer, the white male leading to the maintenance of whiteness and masculinity in this virtual setting. This default setting has led to the marginalization of many minority gamers, forcing the label of deviant upon their virtual bodies. Um, what I really want to focus on, again, I didn't want to focus on like, like the negative, you know, doom and gloom. A lot of people thought that my work was just like all doom and gloom, all this, all this awful stuff happening. Um, I started, you know, kind of reshifting my own focus. So I would just center, I'm like, okay, well, you know, other than dealing with racism and sexism and heterosexism and homophobia, homophobia ableism, you know, what else are y'all doing in these spaces? And I think, you know, these past few years, that's been the crux of, of my research where I'm just saying, hey, you know, I get that this is happening, but you all are doing some really innovative things. So why don't you tell me about that? Um, this piece here, Collective Organizing Individual Resistance or Asshole Griefers, is interesting. The Gamergate kind of crowd, you know, I got trolled for this piece because they thought I was talking about them whenever I was calling, you know, they said, she's calling us assholes. Actually, I wasn't calling them assholes at all. It had, that piece has nothing to do with white men. I'm actually referring to asshole griefers as a, um, there's a, a group that I call the Militant Misses. There's this group of black women that are assholes in Xbox Live. They will troll folks, they will, um, they'll spawn kill, they'll glitch outside the map and shoot, thinking about like a Call of Duty kind of uh, environment. Um, and, and so they had framed their experiences as, you know, this is resistance, you know, we're pushing back against the man. I'm like, no, y'all are just assholes right now. But it was really fun, it was really interesting. Um, I loved it, I did it too. It was exhilarating. Um, but they, they had said that if they hear white dudes in the space any, anywhere, that they were just gonna troll the shit out of them, right? Um, and so there's another segment of, um, of, of women, um, like they kind of did like this collective organizing. So if there was like a problematic game that was coming out, um, you know, they tried to like boycott it. They would like go down to like their local GameStop and like hold posters up and stuff. It was really dope, it was really awesome. Um, and of course there was some, there was a group, the Militant Misses, they were also really adamant about practice time. They wanted to make sure that the girls that were a part of their clan were equipped with all the skills that they needed to beat every dude that they played, right? Um, and then it was, um, you know, of course it kind of, kind of diminished like the enjoyment of the game. You know, I, I'd like to just have fun, but they wanted to beat the dude so they could say, hey, you just got beat by a girl. That was big for them. I, I thought it was cool. I'm, I'm still glad they allowed me inside their spaces. Um, so if you want to hear more about that, that's my Ada piece. If you all don't know Ada, you should know Ada. It's a really dope outlet um, for feminist scholarship and media. Um, my most recent piece looked at what black, black lesbians do um, within these spaces. This was a really, um, let me pull up this quote first, and then I'll give you some background on this space. I can't be who I want to be on Facebook or Twitter. I know too many of those people in real life. And like my real friends aren't gamers, so this is a space I have all to myself to really be like me, you know? I know that might sound crazy, but my mom read one of my chats one time because I forgot to log out of Facebook. Luckily, it wasn't too crazy, but I don't really have a private life on Facebook, and Twitter is just too much. Ain't nothing really like Xbox, that's just me. So first off, Everybody and their mama on Facebook, right? And so it's not like this private space that a lot of folks have, like to you know express the, their whole range of identities, right? So a lot of the, the women here exclaimed that Xbox Live was a place where they could still go to be who they are. There was a, um, a useful, oh, this is just um, quotes, just in case some people need to know like the scope of, of some of these spaces, you know, face, everybody's on Facebook. Um, but Xbox Live, PlayStation, you can kind of see um, other numbers there. But, um, uh, we, they've gone through this. Um, so what I found with, with that piece is that um, there's a lot of community building that's happening among those black lesbians. One young lady, she lives in a highly religious um, household. She's not out to her family. Um, they, she said they really like have no idea. Like, so she leads like a very heterosexual um, life, you know, where she has a friend um, who she, you know, says is her boyfriend. He's gay also, and so, and then he looks at, 
uses her as like her, his girlfriend. So it's really interesting, you know, what they what they have to do. But when they go on Xbox Live, you know, they've got the privacy. You know, they get they've got these chats, and they'll spend hours, you know, with this this community that, that they've developed. Um, where they can, you know, be be who they are, and I thought that was um, that was really powerful. Um, not only the community building aspect, but also the like um, this digital identity development, where um, a lot of them are able to explore their identity in a in this digital space in a way that they're not in their physical setting. I think that's that's really that's really powerful. Um, current research questions, again, I'm, I'm running out of time, so I want to make sure that you all know like the crux of, of what I'm doing right now. Um, I'm asking broadly these three questions. How do women communicate intersectionality in digital, digital spaces? How do they respond to resistance to intersectionality? And how does intersectionality influence one's digital media praxis? I started asking these questions because they're the practices of all these women and the, the men that I've um, um, that I've studied over this whole decade, their practices in these space, spaces are intersectional, but they never utilize the term intersectionality. The term intersectionality was very foreign to them, right? Um, and so I wanted to kind of ask them, because um, I've noticed that after, um, you know, with the rise of Black Lives Matter, you know, with Ferguson, with the Women's March, um, now, you know, intersectionality has, like, gone viral. So I wanted to get a sense from them, I'm like, how do you interact? What, what does intersectionality mean to you, right? Um, so this is kind of, here, I'll, I'll skip this. Um, we spend a lot of time in physical spaces, um, but we also spend mostly, most of our time like in Xbox Live. So I had noticed that with the rise of, of, of um, the, the campaign of Donald Trump, and the, the rise of white supremacy, um, a lot of the folks had started engaging with intersectionality, but they wouldn't, um, they would retweet. They engaged it through forms of, of retweets, right? Um, so they understood it. They understood what the tweets meant. So, like for instance, Encyclopedia Brown, which a lot of the women within the study follow, um, white people, that's not racist. Black men, you don't get to decide that. Also, black men, that's not sexist. Black women, bruh, seriously, hashtag intersectionality. So a lot of these tweets are like generating like a lot of conversations like around what intersectionality means and what it means for them personally, right? Not like in a theoretical kind of way, kind of like, you know, this academic exercise that we may do, but day to day, what does intersectionality look like? So it was really interesting that these um, conversations among these black men and black women within, within the study that I'm doing, um, they would use other folks' um, tweets around intersectionality to kind of generate conversations, especially the black women, you know, making black men be accountable for their actions, taking up a lot of space, not allowing um, them to have, um, uh, have like a voice or have a platform within a lot of the organizing that they were doing. Um, so I thought that was very um, interesting. But I wanted to, add, I wanted to see, um, this is a part of the project that I'm also working on, but I really wanted to see not what somebody else says, but what do you say about intersectionality? So I actually, I, I asked them, um, well, this is, this is in re relation to, um, to hashtag intersectionality. So let me read this quote here. I'll explain what it is. Tierra, see, when I go online, well, right after he was elected, I found myself like a troll hunter. I looked for every instance of hating online. Me, what kind of hating? Folks hating on Auntie Maxine, talking shit about Beyonce. Enough folks are standing for Hillary, so I didn't fuck with that one. But anybody talking shit about black women, I was on it. How did you find these folks? You follow them online, following hashtags? Yeah, I just typed in the hashtag, hashtag intersectionality, and scroll. I would find them talking shit and go off. I would exhaust them. I'm tired of them deciding what it means, like they control who we are. So Tierra kind of took it upon herself to kind of be like the personal crusader, social justice warrior, you know, for intersectionality, especially when people would wrongly um, kind of articulate what intersectionality means, like it's divisive, decisive. Um, so for instance, this, this quote kind of um, uh, reflects the misunderstanding around intersectionality. So intersectionality is not about tolerance or inclusiveness. It's about dividing into competing identities and battling for victim cred. That's not what intersectionality is at all. So Tierra, she would take it upon herself to kind of go into these spaces and, you know, correct them, call them out and correct them, right? Nene, girl, my timeline looked like Black History Month at an HBCU pre-Katrina New Orleans. Now, Nene's hilarious. Nene is, like, so funny. Um, and I told, like, we laughed for, like, 10 or 15 minutes, you know, after she said this. <laughs> Um, so it took a minute for us to come back, um, but let me go ahead and finish the quote. I love Twitter. I follow these dope-ass women, and I learn so much from them. I keep my timeline black as fuck. I know some of them, other black women, like popping off, but I don't. Shit, we deal with real shit all the time, and I don't mind being in the bubble. So she has 
carefully filtered her bubble, right? So that she's not getting in of any of that negativity or people who don't care really about engaging intersectionality. Um, you know, so she engages, you know, like this positive black affirmation um, around, around intersectionality, right? Um, Corey, um, one, woman identifying, this is not, not, a, not a male. I didn't want my feet to be so reactionary. What do you mean? Like only saying something when somebody else does. Like I wanted to be the one to start the conversation and determine the direction. Does that make sense? Absolutely, give me an example. So I love finding quotes and just posting them. Quotes from Audre Lorde, Nina Simone, all kinds of black women. Well, what kind of quotes? I'll give an example. Like the master's tools, tools quote. I think that one highlights the structural stuff you were talking about. Like I don't give a damn about white boys marching on campus. Well I do, but that's like an individual thing. The bigger picture is what's more dangerous now and so many people don't realize that. Even our own people don't get that. That's why people think it's okay now. Because lynching is over, nah fam, it's the same thing happening. Um, so of course this was around the time of the Charlottesville March um, where um, a lot of folks were reacting to and engaging with, I don't, don't know what's happening, um, um, to, to what was happening on, on the campus like in Charlottesville. And then a lot of folks were like, you know, that's still causing us to have to defend our reality. Like we have to defend, you know, why our lives matter like all the time and that's exhausting and I'm not gonna do it anymore. I don't wanna be reactionary um, to that. And so this is me asking them about um, what intersectionality means for them. Um, so Monica says, it depends on what's happening. So during Ferguson, it meant keeping us alive. And to do that, people needed to know that we get harassed by police more just because we're poor and black. And then with Trump, my gender was more important. I mean, it's always important, but his attacks on women just made it more important to show that like, hey, women are being targeted right now. So intersectionality is situational and could change. Well, I don't mean that it changes. So like me being a woman has always been important to me and I always work to like make sure people know that being a woman is hard. But I think sometimes you gotta highlight certain things at certain times. So this is Monica kind of explaining how you know her the intersectionality kind of ebbs and flows with the, depending on what's happening politically and socially and also personally. Um, and that so like you know when you know the, the campaign around around Trump really highlighted you know like different attacks on women. Gamergate you know also highlight like different kinds of attacks on women. Um, but I think these women because they exist at the intersection their stories and their narratives don't always become central because a lot of us don't know what um, can't make sense of an intersectional reality right that they're um, they're doubly and triply um, impacted um, by what's going on um, so how do you engage intersectionality online Kim I tweet mostly but I like posting pictures too like from our protests our big black bodies and those dope ass signs say more than enough Ashley, I don't think that I'm, I'm good with words, so of course I retweet a lot, but I also post memes and stuff. Like if somebody's talking crazy, that Viola gift is just enough to get my point across. Do y'all know the Viola gift? Or where she's like picking up the purse and like, yeah, okay, I'll, I, think I, I think I'll play it later. Um, let, me, let me get through this, I know I'm running out of time, I'm so sorry. How different does intersectionality look across platforms? I had to kind of like explain, you know, what I, what I meant with, with platforms um, for, for most of them. But well, when I'm on Twitter, it's very vocal, but when I'm gaming, it doesn't even really exist. And not because I can't do it there, but that space really doesn't let me do much. It's not interactive enough, I guess. Kim, but see, I Twitch and use Mixer. Mixer's similar to Twitch. Um, so I'd be saying a whole lot on there. I know when we gaming, it's just us, but when I Twitch, I can talk to different people and I try to play games that let me, you know, like bring up race and stuff. But of course, they ask us being left field, they ain't trying to hear what I'm saying. The comment section, that's what she's, that's what she's talking about. Um, for this is some of the men that are part of, of um, uh, this study as well. Tyson, when I'm online and something happens, I don't use the gaming space to talk about it. You already know how they do me in Twitch. So I might send a DM, but we usually get banned and I'm tired of that. So we usually go to Twitter and put them on blast, gamer tag and all. We feel like we have more power in social media, but not in gaming. And at this point, you know, Tyson, um, after after Ferguson, this is this is an individual that's a part of um, the Xbox study and also like the Ferguson study that, that I'm doing. So he has a pretty massive social media Twitter platform. He has a lot of followers, um, and so you know he his the power that he has is is on Twitter and social media, which is why why he uses it. 
um, Davion. We get more respect than the girls do, though. It's hard for them to even get followers, and that's because they ain't all sexy clad like them other girls be. So he's really he's talking about um, when the w women um, are on Twitch and how people like engage them and what they what they're seeing about the sexualization of of women on Twitch, which is which is very problematic. Um, I know I'm running out of time, but I want to make sure that I get to that GIF because um, everybody should know the GIF. Let me go ahead and speed through this. Let's see. Yeah. Oh, you did? You put it out there? Okay, good, good, good. That's, that's the one I'm talking about. That's it. Okay, okay, my bad. I appreciate y'all. <laughs> I'm trying to think of another one that they often, uh-oh, let's see, there I go bad. Yeah, Nene is another one. Yeah, okay. All right, okay, I'm done. My bad. Thank y'all. I appreciate y'all. That's it. Okay, so we have some time. Uh, we have some time for some questions, but I'm actually going to ask the first one. So many of the um, participants here are actually in my class, and after spring break, they're going to be asked to make an intersectional game. So as someone who just spoke a lot about intersectionality, if you had to pitch a ga idea for an intersectional game, what would it be? No one gets to steal it, but hopefully it like generates some ideas. You can talk, you have a mic. Hair and all. Do you know this game? Oh yeah, we're playing it. Yeah, um, I love it. It's perfect. And because people are mad at it, it makes me love it even more. Um, it's saying a whole lot without saying anything at all, right? Um, at the intersection of being black and woman, at the intersection of race and gender, right? Um, it's also, you know, discussing what a lot of people don't talk about, it's really at the intersection of class too, um, because if we think about, you know, the more vulnerable, you know, your class positionality is, you know, the more subject you are to people thinking that they have control over your bodies, right? Um, so if you think about like that vulnerable position that a lot of people, to get padded all the time, you know, to be like touched and stuff, um, um, it's, it's problematic. So I would say, hair, for those who don't know, let's go ahead and put hair and on up there. <laughs> um, we'll play a few rounds as I'm talking. But I think that it's a, it's a beautiful game. Um, that, you know, essentially a black woman was frustrated and she was like, you know, let me visualize, you know, my frustrations of people always coming um, to, to play with my hair. But I would, yeah. Um, but other games can also be mobilized for the project of intersectionality, right? So Grand Theft Auto, I know, you know, David, you know, talked about, you know, he didn't want to play Grand Theft Auto with his kids, like, but there is a lot to be said around Grand Theft Auto um, about the, so if you think about the women of color, for those of you who have played Grand Theft Auto, where are the women of color located within GTA, within the environment of GTA? In the alleys, street workers, they're, 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 they're sex workers. You know, they, they walk the streets, they're vulnerable, you know, to the main character who can just pick you up at any time, he'll blow his horn and then you have to go. You don't have the choice to not go. Um, they will have sex with, Rape, I'm gonna call it rape. They will rape you to get their health up and get their money back. Like that right there, you know, really exists at the at the intersection of race, gender, sexuality, class. Um, and again, you know, most people wouldn't have read it that way. But I think that's also um, a lot. A lot can be said. Even I'm even thinking about the um, the GTA with um, uh, CJ from San Andreas, wh whatever number that one was. Um, that intersection of race and class. You know, they essentially, you know, kind of normalize this life. They put us right in the ghetto. They put us right in the middle of the hood without ever explaining how CJ kind of got there. And then the game opened with the most important narrative that we overlook and ignore, police brutality of the LAPD. You know, Tenpenny, was that a Samuel uh, Jackson's character? Tenpenny basically was putting bodies on CJ, you know, basically making, setting him up for something if he didn't engage in this criminal life. That completely gets ignored because a lot of people said, oh, the sexualization, the hypersexualization, you know, is the most like important thing. Um, and so I think there was like a real miss like around, around conversations around, around GTA. Um, we, we would, we would have had it if David Leonard would have just kept his work going. I mean, <laughs> come on. No. <laughs> no, we've got it. I'm probably, we've got it. Okay. Yeah. There was first question. I don't know why I can't play the game. There we go. Oh, somebody had beat it. Here, it was the end. Way. Okay, okay, go ahead and play. Have? Okay, other question. Awesome. Um, thank you so much for that talk. I really liked the idea of instead of just looking at how people, what, what people have to endure online, let's look at what people are doing within their own spaces. And my question is, 
how do we start to feed the praxis that we're seeing in these spaces back into the mainstream mega platforms like Twitter and Facebook and stuff? And or is that even something that we want to do? Is that a good idea? Yeah. Um, I don't know if those, you mean how, like the, the praxis of like women, how are they kind of translating back into like the mainstream spaces? Is that, is that what you're saying? Yeah, like so Twitter is always saying, help us figure out how to curb harassment. And we have a lot of women and people of color being like, well, let us tell you. And they're like, no, instead, let's just make 240 characters the new right. thing. Um, right. They're not invested in it. Um, and I noticed that, too, especially with the, um, the lack of response or when, when Xbox Live decides to respond to me. Um, it's not to ask for help. It's really to kind of put a stamp on something that they've done. So they're like, hey, Kishana, take a look at this innovation. It's going to solve that problem you've been talking about for years. So basically, I got mad. I'm like, oh, so you've been paying attention to this. You, you probably received my mail and my letters and all that stuff. You've just ignored it. And then you want to give me something to kind of placate me. So I'm thinking about like the recent um, changes, all these changes that they try to do, like with the different... Um, you know, like when you're filtered into different spaces, the casual, hardcore family, all those kinds of things. They've been trying to do things to kind of curb the toxicity in the space. Um, but they're, they don't have the right people at the table. I'm even thinking about with um, um, whenever Matt was just talking yesterday, our keynote, for those of you who were uh, fortunate enough to really be at the keynote, you know, he gave us like these different kind of practices for inclusivity, and they aren't really doing that. You know, they aren't bringing the people to the table that, you know, have experienced this and that may have um, really useful ideas um, to do something about, you know, the toxicity in the space. Um, also, Xbox doesn't do a good job at like keeping the numbers up. So when you think about, you know, demographics, they don't know how many people of color are in the space. Um, and of course, what, what you revealed to us and what, what you told us, you know, there's a lot of African Americans in the space. There are a lot of Mexican Americans in the space. There are a lot of women within these spaces, but they don't collect a lot of that data. Um, so they probably think that that number is small. It was like a few years ago where Xbox actually had the nerve to proclaim that racism wasn't even a problem. They issued a press release and they said racism is not a problem in our platforms. But they were going solely based on quantitative data of like people filing complaints, right? Um, and so if any of you are in the space, if something happens to you, you're not getting ready to leave the game, go find the gamer tag, go find which complaint within the system, um, you know, fits what just happened to you. You're not getting ready to do it because that means you have to take, remove yourself from the enjoyment of the game where it should be an easier way, which I've always said, make it easier to file complaints and you'll get a sense of the depth and extent of the problem. Um, but yeah, they're not really interested in that. So, yeah. Oh, are we winning? No. <laughs> What's she doing? What's she doing? I love it. I should probably win. I love it. No, 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 you're doing great. This is great. You're doing great. Yeah, another question. Oh, no, I'm just not paying attention. Put it on the mic. Put it on the mic. Oh, yeah. So if I see some of the hands are getting, I have never played this, so I don't know. But like, if, if it touches too long, do you, what happens? If the hand like mm, touches, yeah. I love this. <laughs> I love this. It's perfect. It's perfect. Just let lose. Do you die? Is oh, you lose. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So you just lose. So look, well, that was that. That was the, the screen that just popped up. Yeah, like, yeah, mm, yeah. Chai, like you messing up. Like oh, so, that okay. was like the screen okay. that popped okay. up. So when it gets real red, it's been there too long. They've been touching their hair for too long. Okay. Yeah. No. Other questions. Questions. Don't be awful online. Oh, you have a question? Yes. What are some personal problems that you ran into yourself when on Xbox Live? Um, she wrote a book about it. <laughs> I did. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's okay. It's, okay. it's the same. It's the same. It's the same. So, uh, like most of the women in, you know, from from my um, the study that I'm doing, we don't even engage in the in the larger lobby community, right? We've segregated ourselves into like the private chats. Um, so luckily, you know, Xbox has given us, you know, private DMs and things like that. So we'll meet in these private spaces or we'll go to Twitter and hang out because usually when we go back online and people hear how we sound, they're like, wait, you're a girl. And then, you know, I got to make a sandwich. So I'm like, you know, you want avocado toast or what would you like? You know? Um, so, and also, um, I don't read as black in the space. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's not until they 
like go look at my avatar or go like to my social media pages, which that puts women at very vulnerable positions because these spaces are so connected, right? So a lot of our gaming, our gaming identity is connected to like our social media identity. And like in Facebook in particular, those are real identities in there, you know, so that puts, that put like a lot of women like, you know, Anita Sarkeesian, Brianna Wu, you know, that put them in very vulnerable, um, um, positions um, but a lot of times they'll go find me they'll troll me but I love trolls they don't realize that like I engage trolls um, so um, I kind of do kind of like what um, I think it was Monica said where she's like a troll hunter where she well I don't look for them but I don't I engage them and I don't block them um, so but it's more of the same it's kind of worse though now because like back then whenever I started it it was just an Xbox Live but it's like you know as Twitter has grown you know it's kind of Facebook has grown and I have a public all my social media profiles are public I keep them public um, um, for a reason, but that also puts me at a very like vulnerable position to harassment and trolling. Yeah. Yeah. Another question. Yeah. Oh. Yes. Because game platforms like Steam and everything are opening up, it's becoming a little more global. So, do you yeah. think games going globally will also affect the gender and racial uh, and sexuality inside games, or do you think it'll stay the same? Anti-blackness is global. Uh, yeah, so um, it would be nice. I would love to say, you know, that because the world is so diverse and accepting that it's making, you know, us in the United States, you know, kind of, no, no. Um, um, violence against women is global and that permeates in digital spaces. Um, Anti-blackness is global, that permeates in those spaces as well. Um, if you think about like, um, um, black gamers, black and brown gamers in particular, um, African American and Latino gamers that are part of like the esports culture, uh, their experiences, like whenever they go to like these large tournaments like League of Legends and stuff, like their experiences are, are negative. You know, there's a lot of racial slurs and comments that that are um, that they're subjected to. You know, not only from you know white gamers but also from Asian gamers too. So it's yeah, it's kind of it's sad. Makes me sad. Well, we can fix it. We'll save the world. Let's do that. Okay. <laughs> I think she had a question. Do you have a question? Uh, yeah, actually. Um, okay. so, um, you looked like you had a question. Yes. <laughs> um, so with um, the uh, rise of movements like Black Lives Matter, mm -hmm. uh, with the Women's March, and those becoming uh, far more public um, and really uh, entering conversations regarding race and gender into uh, the mainstream American public. I'm curious, so you mentioned how you've been doing this over 10 years, and when, I'm fascinated by comment section culture. Um, that's what my research looks at on Facebook. Um, and okay. so I'm curious that over the 10 years on the various platforms mm -hmm. and spaces that you have researched, um, you know, what kind of differences have you noticed um, from white male gamers um, and, and their responses to members of marginalized groups? I mean, have you noticed a difference um, or, or not? No. Um, the differences haven't come from those who engage in toxic practices online. The, the real differences and the changes and the different patterns that I see are mostly marginalized folks' responses to it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, at first there was like this, this tendency to kind of just leave. So there was like a mass exodus of a lot of folks out of these gaming communities because of what they were experiencing. Um, and then, you know, there was like a, you know, like a return. Um, and then I think um, people just accepted that, you know, these corporate entities weren't gonna save them. Um, and so they just had to kind of develop like their own communities, you know, their own siloed, isolated, segregated communities within these different pockets of, 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 of gaming, social media, um, where they kind of develop like these resistance practices. Not even like, you know, resistance to like, okay, let's go and, you know, fight the man today. You know, not, not like that, but really like taking care of one another, making sure that people are okay. Um, so like, you know, when somebody is like a target of, you know, like, like attacks like on Twitter, you know, there's like a community of folks that will reach out, you know, to them and say, hey, we've gone through this, how can we support you? Um, so I know, I'm even thinking about, I love shouting out like the Sassafras Tech Collective, Jill Diamond, you know, those awesome folks, they, they do really innovative stuff around how women can protect themselves 
like online because of like the harassment and stuff that, that they face. So again, like I said, I haven't seen many changes on the toxicity side, but there have been like a lot of innovative, even, you know, tech, tech has been, is innovative where you can, you know, download different kinds of apps that'll let you filter that stuff out, you know, kind of automatically block, you know, some of that stuff. Um, and it's sad because really we aren't, are we improving things or we're just, I think we're still just kind of learning to live in a very racist, sexist, heteronormative kind of society still. Yeah. Sorry, I wish I had a better answer. That things are getting better. But really, like, it's the same things. Like, and it's like, it's like, um, it's like a, a template. Like, you know, they're so cliche. Like, you know exactly what they're going to say. Like, I don't know. Like, I get tired of, like, here, wait, are you a girl? Oh, that made me a sandwich. I'm like, come on, get some new material, dude. You know? I was waiting for it, you know? But you don't really see that. Like, okay, I'm, like, I've been, I'm, I'm numb to being called the N-word. I'm numb to being called bitch. I'm like, all right, okay, I haven't heard that before. You know, it, it's very, like, cliche. And again, I think one of the things that a lot of people, you see, like, in a lot of work now, you know, when people talk to these who engage in this toxic manner online, that they don't even mean any kind of offense. You know, they're saying, we just want to get a rise out of people. You know, we're not trying to be mean or whatever. I'm like, okay, yeah, sorry, go ahead. So what are features or simple things that you'd like to see creators or curators of online spaces do or things that are frequently missed or just overlooked because a lot of times the creators aren't thinking about yeah. creating safe spaces or intersectionality? Yeah. Like you said last night, bring the folks to the table. Bring them and actually listen to them. You know, because I, I know uh, something really powerful that, that you had said, um, Eddie Hemi thing, he had said something like, you know, like, we, we make the games, but you do, so it was something really powerful. Like, you know the culture, something like that. And I think that it's important. I wish the people that, who do and make amazing things, I wish they would listen to people. So kind of walk me through what happened. What, and then like kind of have like really like this organic experience where they're making the changes like together, right? But I think it's the top down approach, it, it's, not, it's not working. You know, Twitter's implemented things. Facebook has implemented things. Even, I mean, even we were talking about, you know, Riot. Well, I had high hopes for the tribunals that Riot implemented um, for, um, was it League of Legends? Um, but I didn't realize that had been, like, disbanded. And I wonder if it's been disbanded. I'm like, I, I wanted to know the behind the scenes, you know, who was a part of that conversation that got that going. And maybe they had, of course, maybe it was like a top-down approach where they didn't really think about the people who were victims of most of the toxicity in, in that community. Um, but I wish there was, I wish they would just bring more folks to the table. Because, um, you know, we can create our own tables, but they're not going to listen to us. They're not going to say, oh, those dope-ass women are doing amazing things. Let's go see what they... No, they're, they're not going to do that. So at least if you're not going to, you know, disrupt and dismantle your table, at least bring us to the table so at least we can have some, some kind of say. But really, that simple thing. Like, because I haven't... I am going to be brought to the table kind of in a roundabout way soon. But um, I think whenever I was asked to... to whenever I had that, that brief brief relationship with Microsoft. They wanted to know um, my opinion about a thing that they were implementing. Um, and um, they wanted a lot of labor from me, right? So I talked about it. I'm like, okay, well, how, well here's, here's my rate. This is what you can pay me. And then they, there was nothing. They didn't want to pay me for my labor, right? Whereas I had inside information where they pay people. They, and then they weren't gonna pay me, so I had a problem with that. Um, but I've been invited to um, you know, the Blacks and Gaming kind of green room that Xbox kind of sponsors. Um, but again, it's a space for black folks in gaming. There aren't gonna be like executives in there hearing what we're talking about. Um, so it's good, it's beautiful, because it's a beautiful community. I'm um, coming up at GDC um, in a couple weeks. But again, the people that need to hear what we're saying, they're not in that space, so I don't know. I don't know. Tell your homies. I know some of y'all, like, Xbox Live is like down the street, ain't it? Like y'all tell them, hey, check out Kishana's work. She's dope. She can save you. Five hours down the street. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Kishana's from Arizona, so. <laughs> yeah. Everything's, everything's down the street, my bad. Every, yeah. Thank y'all. Eventually down the street. All right, so that will you. conclude um, Kishana's talk. Thank you. Uh, she has a lot more to say and do, as well as our other speakers and presenters for the symposium. So I hope that you come back this afternoon. The schedule is on the other side of this whiteboard right here. Unfortunately, those will not be live streamed, 
but um, you can come experience all the wonderfulness in person. So let's give her a big round of applause for coming up here. <clears throat> And thank you all for joining us for the 2018 CDSC Spring Symposium. Thanks.